Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. We're going to give it about another minute to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room here. Good afternoon again. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on the VWD guidelines and diagnosis. My name is Brett Spitali and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available this Friday on the events section of the NHF website at nhf.org. I'm joined today by someone in our community who really needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Robert Cedeno. Uh, um, thank you for taking the time to join us again, sir. And um, I'll now turn it over to get you to get us started, Robert. All right, thanks a lot. And thanks everybody for joining today. Um, and, and this is gonna be part of a, a multiple session series. Uh, if I remember correctly, the next one is gonna focus on management. Um, but we really wanted to make sure that not only do we uh, produce the guidelines, but we disseminate them and make sure we explain them to the community about some of the critical changes. And certainly we're not going to cover everything that we did um, in this guideline, but I'm going to cover a good portion of it, spending a little bit more on time on things that I feel are a little bit more critical. All right, so um, you know we want to make sure everyone knows what the mission of NHF is, dedicated to finding cures for inheritable blood disorders and addressing and preventing the complications of these disorders. And that's really through research, education, advocacy, and enabling people and families to thrive. So I thank NHF for allowing us to provide this forum. Um, it's important that we have disclosures. Um, as part of the process, uh, there was a pretty significant uh, process um, in place uh, that was set up by ASH, um, but this organization, this was, um, you know, put on by ASH, ISTH, NHF, and WFH, and it was really um, uh, important, um, and they also included four patient representatives in addition to the panel of scientists and um, uh, clinicians. And we used uh, Reem uh, Mustafa, um, who is fantastic from Kansas City uh, Medical Center. We really took her guidance and, and were able to, uh, she was able to shepherd this through. And this really took over two years uh, to go through. And we were a little bit on, a little bit sequestered and a little bit locked down for a while um, um, when we were working on these. So it's important to understand this was an international effort. Um, it took a lot, a lot of people involvement. We had a number of virtual meetings and face-to-face -face meetings. Thankfully, we were able to get through most of the meetings before the pandemic. It's important to understand there are actually two papers. You can see here, uh, Paula James uh, was leading the diagnostic portion of the guidelines. And there was a separate group um, um, which we overlapped a little bit. Um, that was a management group led by Nathan uh, Connell. And you can see Reem Mustafa is the senior author on here because she really helped us through the process of this. So I think just like anything else, I think the best way to illustrate um, what, we, what the changes are, what we need to do is really through cases. And so that's what I'm gonna do today. So let's start off with a nine-year-old male we had a personal bleeding history, but no family history of bleeding. This is pretty common, something I see every week in my clinic. A mother reported that he had epistaxis or nosebleeds. He did require cautery. You know, down here in, 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 in Georgia and the South generally, epistaxis is quite common and a very small portion of the patients end up having an underlying bleeding disorder. But he had a history of anemia that was associated, so pretty significant nosebleeds. 
no early life bleeding. He reported some easy bruising, maybe not at the level uh, of uh, reportable, uh, no prolonged skin bleeding. He hadn't had any surgeries, but he did have some issues with dental extraction that required repacking and tea bags. So certainly enough that warranted a workup. The question that was given to us, or at least, you know, that came up was the primary care provider said, should I consider a bleeding disorder evaluation? This is a common question. What is the level of bleeding that necessitates uh, fairly expensive uh, bleeding workup? So people may remember this from the Mets, uh, broken bat to the face. It's like adding insult to injury, you know, missing, missing the ball and then hitting yourself in the face. And sometimes we feel this way about all the different bleeding assessment tools that we call BATS. There have been a number of them. Uh, some of them have better names than others. There's the Vicenza one. Uh, most of these originated out of Italy, including the condensed MCMDM1 BWD questionnaire, probably the longest name of a questionnaire ever. Um, and uh, subsequently, the ISTH BAT or bleeding assessment tool, and then a tool was uh, made in which the families or the patient could self-complete it and didn't require expert uh, administration to ensure that the scoring was correct. And so that's available online. I put the, the links on there um, from the Netherlands and also from a great website from Let's Talk Period. And note that that's .ca because it's a Canadian website. I'm personally partial to the pediatric bleeding questionnaire just because it's really easy. I can print it out on one page and circle the numbers. And for the kid that we just talked about, he had you know, required packing from epistaxis, had some cutaneous bruising over a centimeter without trauma, and also had a dental extraction. So if you add that up, that's three plus one plus three, uh, certainly higher than two. And so a, a high enough score definitely to necessitate uh, a hemostatic evaluation. And so the way that they came up with this is that there were a number of questions that we had to come up with and we were limited on the number of questions. And then we had to sort of uh, come up with um, what questions we wanted to, to move all the way until the end. And we came up with 10 of them. And um, then we had to make decisions whether we recommended for or against. And for this one, this one had three parts. And the question really focused on what was the utility of a bleeding assessment tool in deciding whether you should get a bleeding workup. And that's in comparison to a non-standard bleeding evaluation, which is just me asking a bunch of questions about bleeding. So what we decided was that for uh, patients with a low probability of von Willebrand's, the panel recommended using a validated bleeding assessment tool over just a non-clinical, non-standard way of asking. And when we mean low probability of von Willebrand's, we mean the situation that I just described. Somebody's in the office at a primary care office. The pretest probability is somewhere between 0.1 and 1%. And so certainly you should use a bleeding assessment tool to discriminate uh, the bleeding. For those with an intermediate probability, and that would be like a patient that's got past the gatekeeper and now is in our bleeding disorder clinic. Maybe they have an abnormal bleeding screen and they have an abnormal, um, you know, a, a number of bleeding symptoms that got them in our clinic. Well, the pretest probability is a little bit higher, probably somewhere between 10 to 20%. And so in that situation, the panel says, you don't need to use a validated bat. Somebody comes in with abnormal low VWF because the primary care sent that. You don't really need to set, do a bat to decide whether you should repeat it or not. And so um, certainly we think there's some utility for using the bleeding tool. It's a good way to inventory the bleeding symptoms. And for those with a high probability of von Willebrand's, so if you come in and the mother has von Willebrand's that's been diagnosed and definitely seen, um, and also if, if a sister or a sibling has von Willebrand's, there's no reason to use a bat to decide whether to do testing. The probability is at least 50% for most autosomal dominant conditions. So there's no reason to say, well, we should probably uh, use a tool to discriminate. So in that situation, definitely inventory the bleeding, but just go ahead and proceed with um, the hemostatic evaluation. So going back to this case, it totally makes sense to use a bat uh, because this is a low probability case. So use a bat in a low probability case. You don't have to use a bat in an intermediate or high um, probability case. 
All right, so let's move on to a next recommendation. So 18 year old female has a personal history of bleeding, but no family history of bleeding. She has heavy menstrual bleeding. She has um, flooding associated with it, passing clots larger than a grape. Periods last longer than seven days. She's had anemia. Anytime a teenage girl has anemia, it's either GI or menstrual, or there's something else wrong with the bone marrow. She really didn't have a lot of other bleeding symptoms. She did have an admission for post tonsillectomy to bleed. At the time, they didn't think it was warranted coming in, probably should have. Um, and so this comes up a lot. So she's been followed for the last eight years. Her previous labs were barely diagnostic and now they're not diagnostic per the most recent criteria. And so what do we do? Do we consider removal of the diagnosis? This was a question that was addressed um, by our panel as well. First of all, there were some things that we wanted to capture in the guidelines, but we knew it probably didn't belong in this format. And so separate from this, Nathan Connell led us to a definitions papers, a definition paper of uh, of sort of things that we feel make sense to utilize in upcoming uh, to communicate more efficiently. So when we say heavy menstrual bleeding, this is what we mean by heavy menstrual bleeding. This is the proposed definition that we had. Lasting eight or more days, soaking through one or mo more sanitary protection uh, every two hours on multiple days. And remember, they can have any of this criteria. Requiring the use of more than one sanitary protection item at a time changing it during the night, associated with passing blood clots the size of a grape, or having a pictorial chart score of greater than 100. So this is what we thought was reasonable to use when we say the words heavy menstrual bleeding. And there are a number of definitions, and I invite you to read that paper. Uh, it's useful for those particularly that are interested in clinical research. Another tool that we encourage the use, but we didn't need to define because it's been defined, uh, Claire Phillip, uh, created a screening tool to determine whether you should consider bleeding workup. And this is mostly meant to be used by the gynecologists or the adolescent doctors. But these questions are irrelevant for us as well that we should utilize. And so um, um, going back to this case, the labs here are barely diagnostic. <coughs> At the time, we didn't have the GP1BM testing. But you can see the antigen is 45. The risk to setin is 40, and the factor rate is normal as typical in most type 1 patients. So at the time, they were labeled as probable von Willebrands, um, low VWF, very mild von Willebrands, all these different qualifiers that we created um, because we didn't know what uh, to call um, these patients. And so, you know, the pictorial chart is listed there. She certainly met the criteria of heavy menstrual bleeding. And so one of the things that we wanted to address before we get to the uh, issue of removal of diagnosis, uh, we wanted to add, we asked one of the questions, um, the functional assay of ristocetin cofactor has a lot of issues, particularly with pre-analytic variables. It's highly sensitive to having falsely low levels based on even just minor issues with um, the way you process it. So as soon as you grab the sample in the tube, there are a number of things that could go wrong that could lead to a falsely low ristocetin cofactor, including the fact that there's a, a wide coefficient of variation. So you can certainly get a level of 30 one time and then get a level of 42 the other time and that totally be within the range. So the question that we posed was, should we use some of these newer assays, the GP1BM or the GP1BR or a number of other functional assays uh, that measure the platelet binding activity? Should we use those over ristocetin cofactor? Certainly places like Blood Center Wisconsin have moved away from the ristocetin cofactor assay. None of us really like that assay. I don't know, I've never met anybody that appreciates that assay. We all hate that assay, but it's, it's a necessary thing that we have. This, it's still the standard with regards to measurements and management. Um, and so we said, even though there's low certainty in evidence, we know the trend is to move away from the ristocetin cofactor and embrace these newer assays. And I listed here a typical pattern panel of uh, laboratory uh, values that we would get on a patient that's uh, being evaluated for von Willebrands. So if you look at the patient, we repeated the labs multiple times years later and every few years, the labs would go up a little bit more. 
And maybe that risk to seed and cofactor was 40 in the beginning, and maybe it really wasn't ever 40. And it was just uh, an issue because we had some issues in our lab um, uh, when I got to Atlanta. But look at the labs now. They're certainly above the diagnostic threshold. This is now just an adult. And so what do we do? And so uh, it often comes up, should we remove the, the diagnosis? Should we follow them outside of the HTC? And so this is a real practical issue that we have in our community. And so we address that. So we call it a historical diagnosis of von Willebrands. Uh, and I believe uh, Wisconsin has labeled it as type 1H uh, as historical. But now they have normal levels. What do you do? Well, the panel suggests even though there's low certainty in the evidence, reconsidering the diagnosis as opposed to just removing the label. One thing that's important to do is that maybe you should consider platelet dysfunction if you didn't consider it in the past. Make sure that you got all of the battery of labs that are necessary to make a diagnosis at the time. Maybe you didn't have all those labs. And it's really important that we obtain those labs at a specialized laboratory that understands how to do these testing. We understand with pregnancy, with aging, other comorbidities, your levels are gonna increase on average at least 1% per year. And it's important to acknowledge that. What we don't know is that, will the reduction of bleeding symptoms correlate with rising levels? And are, is there an age specific um, level of von Willebrands for a 70 year old versus a 15 year old? Those are things that we don't know currently. And hopefully we'll be able to address these in the state of the science uh, that NHF is uh, undergoing right now. Certainly we should understand that there were people that had falsely low risk to seed and cofactors just because somebody had one level, you know, 10 years ago and every single risk to seed and cofactor after that, that doesn't mean that they actually had the diagnosis. Uh, and it's very common to have issues with pre-analytic variables, variables and have issues with falsely low risk to seed and cofactor. It's something we definitely should acknowledge. And so going back to this case, you know, we shouldn't just say we're gonna remove the diagnosis. Typically what I do is we follow the patients a few years after they have normalized their levels. At the time of this, if their bleeding symptoms have reduced, we may back off and say, well, for procedures, we may consider just observation and having Amicar available. Um, and so we sort of get a test of what needs to be done uh, moving forward. And so um, just one second, I keep getting a phone call here. So um, um, let me just tell somebody to call somebody else. Sorry about that. Um, so moving forward on this, um, let's, let's go into the um, patient case number three. So this is a 12-year-old with a personal history of bleeding and an older sister who's been labeled as having low VWF. So um, certainly uh, she has heavy menstrual bleeding. She's got flooding. She has periods that last longer than seven days. She plasses clots. Really doesn't have a lot of other bleeding symptoms other than easy bruising. So what's her diagnosis? So here are the labs. This isn't the DDAVP challenge labs. Um, but certainly um, these are the labs at one point and then repeated um, later. And so definitely fits in that low VWF range. And she has a positive DDAVP challenge. One of the things that we wanted to take on during the panel was what is the definition of a DDAVP challenge? You'll be surprised that it's done quite differently at multiple centers. So we uh, took on the task of defining it. The little bit of history Many minor procedures require a level over 50%, um, and that may be enough, but it's really important to not acknowledge neurosurgeries, major surgeries, probably have to get the levels above 100%. When it says 1.0, that means 100%. And so um, just because somebody has a positive DDAVP challenge, that does not mean that their levels are gonna be adequate for maybe a major surgery. And previous definitions have really focused on two to three fold increases. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Like who cares how much, what fold you go up? It's where does your level get to after the DDAVP? And so we compromised on a definition of greater than two times the baseline, sustain, sustaining factor eight and VWF at four hours. And so what that means is that you check your levels at baseline, you give the DDAVP, and that can be intravenous, sub-Q, 
uh, can be also um, uh, intranasal when we get that back. Check the levels at one and four hours. We often do three hours here because practically uh, we live in a state that has a lot of traffic and uh, I have never seen a difference between three and four hours that changes my practice. Um, so that's one thing that we addressed. Um, the other thing that we wanted to address was that the panel suggested against using the propeptide uh, ratio of an over antigen rather than using a desmopressin trial. So there are two ways that you can decide whether a patient has accelerated clearance. One is to do a practical DDAVP trial, and the other one is to use a more novel assay comparing the uh, propeptide to the antigen. And I'll show you what that means. So if you see to the side here, you see that it's uh, the VWF is the mature VWF portion and then the propeptide portion. Um, it, uh, the propeptide has been used as an indicator of synthesis secretion, also a good indicator of endothelial damage. And um, both of them are released into the plasma from the Weibel Pilate bodies and they circulate independently of each other. So there's one unit of VWF, one unit of propeptide in one mils of plasma, and they have a ratio around one to one. Type 1C or Vincenza or clearance time by von Willebrands is characterized by markedly reduced survival of VWF in the plasma. So the survival goes from eight to 12 hours to one to two hours. So certainly much uh, shorter half-life um, than before. And patients with an increased clearance will have a normal propeptide level, but a decreased VWF. So what you end up is, is a elevated propeptide to VWF ratio. So instead of one-to-one -one ratio, you end up with a higher than one-to-one -one ratio, which would be suggestive of a clearance defect. But remember, um, we recommended uh, that desmopressin trial made more sense. Um, if you look here, if you're wondering what happens uh, when you give, um, um, sorry, let me answer this text here. So I think there's uh, someone that needs uh, immediate assistance. So um, there's, um, when you give DDAVP, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, you look at the Ristocetin, and there's an appropriate rise, um, maybe not quite as much, but then there's a very rapid drop and return to baseline very quickly. And that's in contrast to the very slow drop in baseline in the type ones. And you can see here on the antigen, you get a very, you get a similar rise, but a very quick drop. And this is something you would see with type two N von Willebrands as well. And these are the situations in which desmopressin is probably not gonna be beneficial. So going back to the case, the patient has levels that meet the criteria of low VWF, mild von Willebrands, we talked about using a DDAVP challenge to decide whether we want to um, decide whether there's concern for a clearance defect. We also uh, defined uh, what a desmopressin challenge was. And then the big question here is, what do you do? And this was the question that took us multiple days of very long hours of vigorous debate and, uh, and this is no different than previous guideline sessions in which this is probably one of the more debated topics in VWF, is where, where is the diagnostic threshold for VWF? The previous guidelines set it at 50 uh, as being normal, but diagnostic for von Willebrand, specifically type one, was less than 30. The problem with that is, is what do you call those with 30 to 50? So some people, some guidelines called it low VWF, which I actually appreciate that one because, uh, and I'll tell you why, Probable von Willebrands, nobody liked that one. I can't imagine anybody liked anything that's probable. Uh, can you imagine saying somebody has probable hemophilia? That's pretty silly. Um, and uh, mild or very mild von Willebrands. And what we decided as a group is that we put a strong value on inclusion of patients, making sure that they had resources. And so we recommended a threshold of less than 30, regardless of any bleeding phenotype. So if you send the levels on a six month old and they've never bled, and they're less than 30%, that patient has von Willebrands. And in contrast, if in a patient that's older that presents with bleeding and has levels of less than 50% to confirm the diagnosis of type one von Willebrands. So it's still left the door open for those with 30 to 50 that maybe you set the levels on and they never had bleeding. 
in all practicality, I'm going to treat those patients and manage them fairly similarly because maybe they haven't had the challenges. So this is a strong recommendation based on low certainty of evidence, but likely any new evidence is going to change that. So remember, when you look at bleeding scores for those with patients um, from 30 to 50 and less than 30, you know, particularly from 20 to 30, the bleeding scores are about the same. When we talk about levels, we, what we mean is antigen or activity assays. Um, we've really moved away from ABO-specific diagno diagnostic ranges um, because they're not particularly useful. If your level is low, then it doesn't really matter that your blood type B or A really is irrelevant. And we put you know, a high value on diagnosis, ensuring access to HTC resources. And what we were trying to do is there are a lot of centers coming up with their own thresholds, which isn't going to help or serve anybody any anything. And, and I think most of these centers were seeking guidance. So, so what about the levels to make a diagnosis this is a great paper by Michelle Lavin, who's a great speaker. Um, and if you look here on the left hand side, with low VWF, that's consistently less than um, 30 to 50. Those patients typically detect variants about 40 to 50% of the time. It's predominantly related to reduced synthesis. And there's a little bit of secretion issues. Um, seen in some cases, it's not very convincing. Um, they may have an elevated propeptide to antigen ratio. Blood type O is overly represented. Often 60, 70% of the group is blood type O. I think the most important thing is, is as these patients age, their levels often become normal um, if they're you know, low VWF in childhood. And that's in contrast if they're low VWF diagnosed in their 30s. It may be much later in their life before they normalize. And again, we don't know what that means. And this is in contrast to type one. When you set the threshold to less than 30, the majority, over 90%, we find a sequence variant, uh, oftentimes on chromosome 12. Typically, it's usually related to a synthesis defect. There may be some enhanced clearance, not always. The blood types are equally represented. The, the, um, the genders are equally represented. And typically the levels don't normalize as you get older. So I think there is a clear distinction between low VWF and von Willebrand's. I'm okay with those labels, um, but I you know, certainly are offering access to our HTC uh, regardless of um, the label that we're using. So let's move on to patient case uh, four. So this is a four-year-old and, and they like to use that term free bleeder a lot in the South. I don't know if they use it outside of this kind, outside of the South but I still hear that word a lot. And that could mean anything. That could mean von Willebrand's hemophilia. It could be anything. Free bleeder is pretty generic. This patient had dental extraction bleeding, bleeding with intramuscular immunizations, easy bruising, prolonged skin bleeding, and had some oral bleeding as well. And so the question for this patient is, what is the best way to proceed with um, her evaluation? You see her labs, you know, those are easy. We always say, uh, it's easy to diagnose hemophilia. Anybody can do that uh, because, you know, if you get good labs, and it's very easy to make that diagnosis. But certainly to try to make a diagnosis of mild von Willebrand's takes a lot more skill. But these labs are clearly low. When you repeat them, they're low as well. And so it's pretty straightforward that this patient has von Willebrand's. Now we need to figure what subtype do they have. And there are a number of different types, and we certainly don't have time to cover it during this presentation. We just really wanted to give you a a flavor of it through the guidelines. You know, there's type 2A and there are multiple mechanisms, either decreased secretion or increased susceptibility to Adams TS13. And typically there's a loss of high and uh, intermediate weight um, uh, molecular weight multimers as evidenced by that little stack there where it says abnormal. Typically the ristocetin is extremely low. The antigen could be normal or slightly reduced. And then the factor rate's typically just below in the normal range. If you look at type 2B, that's actually a gain of function defect in which there's increased binding of platelets. Um, and so you would typically see uh, absence of high molecular weight multimers as well. It's not always the case. And there's plus or minus on thrombocytopenia in those patients. Type 2N, there's an issue with decreased binding to platelets. Typically, they have normal multimer distribution. Um, and have very low ristocetin or GP1BMs. And type 2N is the one of the times where you would actually see the factor VIII lower than the antigen. So that really should be an instant clue that maybe there's a defect 
And typically, um, it's not going to be seen in the homozygous state. It's typically type 1 slash type 2N um, that we see. And we have a number of cases in our clinic. Um, and these are the patients, again, we would not give desmopressin to. So one of the things that we wanted to address, and this is not very controversial, a lot more esoteric, a lot more von Willebrand nerdy, is what cutoff do we use to determine whether we can, where our concern about type two B von or type two von Willebrands. So remember, with von Willebrand's disease, your antigen and your functional activity are going to go down proportionally, typically, and there may be a slight difference. Maybe your antigen's forty and your ristocetin's thirty-five. That's about the same. But in type two, typically the antigen goes down a little bit and then disproportionately the function goes down. So it's more of a qualitative defect. And so we decided as a group that we would use the cutoff based on the available studies of less than 0.7. We wanted to be more inclusive and make sure that we didn't miss type two von Willebrand cases because some of those patients um, may benefit from different strategies and therapy. So this isn't one that's probably gonna you know, anybody's going to be tweeting about uh, today, um, but certainly it was something we wanted to address. And this is a nice chart that's in the, and I'm just going to go briefly through this before I finish this up. But if you start at the top, if you have a patient suspected of having von Willebrand's, you should use a bleeding assessment tool. But like we mentioned before, if it's low probability, then, you know, you should use it to discriminate. Outside of that, you should just use it for inventory. If the patient is negative, then the patient's unlikely to have von Willebrand's or you're unlikely to need to do the hemostatic evaluation. If it's positive, then you would send studies like CBC, PTPTT, thrombin time, fibrinogen, and then you would send some sort of von Willebrand profile, which typically should include antigen. You should always have some form of activity, whether it's ristocetin cofactor or GP1BM in this country, and you should have factor eight activity they all should be collected at the same time and done uh, from the same samples. If your labs, um, if your factor rate's less than VWF, you should suspect type 2N von Willebrand's. If your levels are above 50 on multiple occasions, it's uh, very unlikely that you have von Willebrand's. And this is assuming that you get it in a steady health state, not during pregnancy, not when somebody's anemic, not if somebody comes in with the flu or COVID, your levels are going to be elevated. And so certainly get it in a steady health state. If your levels are less than 30 um, or between 30 to 50 um, or they have bleeding, then you would need to do some sort of ratio. We talked about this doing an activity to antigen ratio and using that less than 0.7, which would indicate type two or greater than 0.17, which would indicate type one. Um, and you can see there, then you would do a DDAVP trial. If you suspect type one von Willebrand's rule out type one C um, and then um, as you uh, normalize with age, you may want to reconsider the diagnosis. And then finally, um, you would consider genetic testing, which we didn't really get into, um, but genetic testing is something to consider um, over doing the low dose um, RIPA testing that typically is done to screen for type 2B von Willebrand's. And so um, that's the one time where they use the genetic testing to discriminate um, um, and make decisions on whether you should do further workup. So um, with that, that's all you need to make the diagnosis of von Willebrand's. And uh, I definitely wanted to thank you um, uh, for putting this together. I really want to thank NHF for the forum, ISTH, ASH, WFH, and NHF for supporting the guideline process, for putting us up uh, in Washington, DC um, and having these very long meetings uh, it was a lot of fun, definitely and look back fondly on it. And I think it was really an important um, thing that we took on. And there was a lot of good leadership from Nathan Connell, uh, Veronica Flood, and Paula James, um, and particularly Reem Mustafa, and a lot of other people that helped out. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Sidonia. We appreciate it. Um, we do have several questions that, that came in. Um, so sure. if you don't mind, I'm just going to dive right in here. Sure. Um, first question comes in and asks, going back to undiagnosing patients, sure. what is the advantage of undiagnosing any patient and what is the benefit to the center or to the patient? So there certainly are going to be patients that we have undiagnosed. If a patient has absolutely no bleeding issues, uh, there is some implications. You know, we, we mostly think about what are the implications of not getting a diagnosis. 
but there are a number of restrictions um, related to jobs that uh, patients often uh, struggle with. And so, you know, these aren't our rules, but oftentimes police departments, people want to go into, into ROTC, wanting to enter the military, work for the fire department, want to, you know, donate uh, blood products. And these are typically not allowed if you have a bleeding disorder. And some patients simply feel like they don't have a bleeding disorder. They don't want to continue to have these restrictions and they don't want uh, to delay surgeries uh, and procedures that they have. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that those patients also don't want to have it. It's oftentimes the family is telling me they don't want the diagnosis. It's not oftentimes that I'm removing it without their permission. And so typically, um, I know a number of people have done this. I've talked to Michelle Lavin and I think Paula James as well about this topic. You know, typically we follow the patients for a few years observing for bleeding. And then we tell them if they have any bleeding symptoms, you should return. And then we can reconsider the diagnosis as well. So it's not like you can never come back. Um, so it's really just an ongoing conversation. So great question. Great, thank you, sir. Next question comes in. Um, are there validated amounts for the PBAC for menstrual cups or period underwear? Yeah, so for period underwear, there is not. Um, for menstrual cups, there's a little bit of validated data, um, you know, because typically if you just look at um, the, um, the packaging, because all the problem is all these cups, you know, Diva Cup being one of the more popular ones, they're all a little bit different. And so really it's the volume. It, it should actually tell you on most of these what the volume of collection is, because that's all they're measuring. And if anything, it's probably more accurate um, um, because you know, you're collecting that. Obviously you're gonna lose some when you remove it, um, but you can get a general idea of, of how much and probably even better than looking at visual representations of pads and, and tampons. And so um, it would be a great study to do, probably should be something to consider um, for our NHF state of the science for the women's group. Certainly I can definitely pass it on. Uh, I know of one paper um, that has it. And so we, I've used it in some studies, um, but certainly should be done more often just to validate that it's useful. Great, great, thank you. Um, next question comes in. Are all labs using the new method of testing or is it available at exclusive laboratory locations? Yeah, so um, there, is, there is a patent, uh, it's not really a conflict or an issue, um, but it's probably leading to the lack of wide availability of the GP1B assay. And this is a great assay. It's just as reliable as the von Willebrand factor antigen. And most of us in the von Willebrand groups know that it's probably gonna replace the Ristocetin cofactor. It, it is interesting, and, and, and maybe for, for right now, I'm using it to supplement the VWF Ristocetin cofactor assay. Um, it's available definitely at Wisconsin. I know other sites are trying to get this uh, assay on board. The GP1BR is available outside of this country. And I know in Canada, they have the assay available to other sites as well. So yeah, it's not widely available. And that's something that was um, discussed in the paper as well, because we didn't want to push an assay that does not have wide availability in which every uh, place can do it. And so um, that, that's why there was a little bit of hesitancy in pushing that assay over ristocetin and uh, burying ristocetin cofactor assay for once and for all. Great, great. Thanks, Dr. Stonia. Um, next question comes in. If there is a low certainty in the evidence, what did the panel base their decision for the recommendation on? Yeah, so, um, you know, and I got the, the wording here. I want to make sure I, I capture that. And so, you know, even though there's low certainty, that doesn't mean oftentimes we need, so we make a strong recommendation or a conditional one. So we make a conditional recommendation. It means most individuals in this situation would want this recommended course of action and only a very small proportion would not. And it, it may be supported by credible research. Um, and what, what's really important is that even though maybe the data isn't there completely, it's unlikely that a further data is gonna change the recommendation, which is really important, right? Just because we don't have data doesn't mean, we, we can kind of guess if, if the data is gonna be useful or not. And certainly for conditional, um, we still feel like there's additional research that needs to be done and it's hard to make a strong recommendation. If you ever work on any of these guideline committees, there almost never is 
strong data, um, you know, strong recommendation, high level of evidence. You're never going to reach that because the kind of studies that have to be done are just not going to be feasible in the bleeding disorder world, certainly for rare disorders. And so you have to take it with a grain of salt that generally if we recommend it, it's really, you know, most of the time it makes sense to do that. And it's unlikely going to change in upcoming guidelines. Great. Great. Um, and on that uh, same topic there, this is about uh, patient two, which the question is referring to the 18 year old woman. Yeah. Um, would that recommendation ch change if they wanted to get pregnant or go through childbirth um, or would it continue to follow? So that's the, um, um, is that's the case of the patient. Uh, let me make sure I got the right case here. Um, I believe they're referring to patient two, which was that, I think, I believe it was the 18 year old young woman. Yeah, this is the 18 year old that um, we were considering the diagnosis. So repeat uh, the question again, Sure. part of it. Sure, would that recommendation change if they wanted to get pregnant or go through childbirth? Yeah, so when we talk about levels, we mean getting levels outside of pregnancy. Um, certainly it's, it would be interesting and I think it'd be reasonable to check labs in the first trimester, you know, assuming that the levels have normalized already and checking it in the third trimester to ensure that they're rising at an appropriate rate as well. I think that's reasonable. This is an area that's probably up for our research. Another great question to, to add to the Von Willerbrand group and the, and to the, um, um, the women's group as well. So I, I think, you know, it's something that would be a judgment call, but if your baseline levels are 55 and your levels rise to 200% at the end of uh, the third trimester, certainly most of us, unless we have very compelling evidence, would observe that, um, um, assuming everything else is normal. But it's something we should just consider, evaluate, and hopefully we'll have more data in the future on this kind of thing. Great. Great, thank you. Um, Nicole is asking some questions here and Len, I'm gonna ask you to help me out and make sure I'm getting these right in the Q&A section. Um, but her questions are a, um, a, a couple, a few of them come in um, and I'll ask them one at a time here. Is there a higher incidence of low VW, VWF associated with type one, type two? Um, I may not understand the question. So low VWF is very common. Um, if you look at the prevalence, if I just ordered VWF labs, I just walked into a random clinic, pediatric clinic, and just started ordering VWF labs, regardless of bleeding symptoms, it's a fairly high prevalence. You're likely to find up to one, one out of 100 patients in that clinic are going to have it. When you're talking about von Willebrand's, it's probably much more um, less common, closer to one in a thousand uh, or even less that you're gonna see that. So we know that blood type O uh, is, uh, definitely affects it. And there's a number of really good papers that probably reflect the prevalence of low VWF. Particularly there was a paper not too long ago, and they're all conflicting of course, of people undergoing GI procedures that have blood type O were more likely to have bleeding complications. You know, that probably reflects the fact that there's an issue with, um, there's probably a higher prevalence of low VWF. But interesting enough, in a, an excellent study done by the late Joan Gill and uh, completed um, by Dr. Veronica Flood, there were a number of patients that had low VWF that went, underwent tonsillectomy that did not bleed. And it certainly wasn't predictive of post-tonsillectomy bleeding. There were patients that had normal levels that bled and some that had low levels that bled. And so it really didn't correlate as well as we would like to have. Um, so there's, it's probably more complicated. I personally feel that stress response, your ability to elevate the levels probably is a big um, variable in determining your bleeding type, uh, your bleeding tendency. And so hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, I think there's a part two and a part three to that as well too. Sure. So I'll go into that. Is there a higher incidence of VWD with factor eight or factor nine? And what about antiphospholipid antibodies and VWD? Um, Len, did I get that right there? Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, I see the questions on here. So. I don't know. So I, I guess the question is how many people have von Willebrands that also have a previous, uh, an existing diagnosis of hemophilia? I mean, certainly low VWF is very common. It's going to be just as common in the hemophilia population. Um, we have a patient right now uh, in the hospital that has low VWF and severe von Willebrands, I mean, severe hemophilia. 
So it's very common. And it's certainly something to think about, particularly if somebody has a short half-life. Um, whether, whether it's relevant in factor nine deficiency is not really clear, but the prevalence is probably the same uh, as the general population, but certainly the implications are important for if you have um, hemophilia, because sometimes we would tend to use plasma-derived products um, to see if we can get a longer half-life if to supplement the low VWF. Um, regarding the question about antiphospholipid antibodies, um, it's difficult to oftentimes to make a diagnosis of a factor deficiency when there's antiphospholipid antibodies um, going on. I don't know any data to show that antiphospholipid antibodies are more common in von Willebrand patients. You may, it may be more commonly found because you're doing a workup for PT and PTT, but certainly I've never seen any data and I don't know what the implications would be in it. Um, but it's certainly, if it's a transient thing, it's definitely worth repeating uh, the labs, particularly the factor eight, because uh, any factor assay is going to be affected by strong antiphospholipid antibodies, which are going to affect the curves in your ability to accurately measure uh, factor deficiency. Great. Great. Thank you, sir. Next question comes in. Um, how do patients advocate for treatment when they are bleeding, um, have levels between 30 and 50%, but aren't being considered or have access to treatment? How should they use these guidelines? Yeah, well, I mean, they should, I mean, they, these guidelines should be used um, and the providers should be reminded um, of the changes in these guidelines. I mean, these are relatively new, um, but that issue is something that we took on. If we went purely scientific, um, probably not much would change with regards to the diagnostic thresholds. And there probably is another subtype of von Willebrands for those patients, you know, particularly maybe in the 40 to 50 range. Um, but certainly if you have bleeding and you have levels of 30 to 50%, you should have access to the hemophilia treatment center, period. And there's no really caveats to it. Um, no qualifying statements. You should have access and this guideline should support your ability to have access. The government wants you to have access as well and doesn't like to hear about uh, issues in which there are not access to the HTC. So if there's an issue, definitely should be something reported to NHF um, and uh, some of the representatives can help, um, help manage that situation, so. Great, thank you. And along those same lines, healthcare providers at the HTCs will clearly get informed about these guidelines. But how do healthcare providers outside of the HTC network, including those in primary care, learn about the new recommendations? Yeah, and that's a tough one. That's going to take quite a long time, I mean, to, to, to dilute out there. Uh, it's really hard to reach emergency room providers, primary care providers as well. I mean, we don't attend a lot of the same meetings. And I, you know, it is hard because we often do these kind of sessions and sometimes I feel like we're preaching to the choir. It's important to preach to the choir some, but then that choir and the person preaching need to go out into the community and, you know, shake the hands and talk to the people and do the politicking that's important. Uh, it's important for HTC providers. You know, we have time and efforts devoted to doing our jobs. Part of my job is to disseminate this out to the community as well. And I try to attend these conferences in which we have primary care physicians come to them, but there are very large number of primary care providers. And oftentimes the best, the other best way is to include snippets of this in um, our guide, you know, in our notes when we uh, do that. And, and oftentimes just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, we've, we've changed these guidelines, they're a little bit different. And I've reached out to our emergency room provider educators and our um, um, primary care ones, because we need to go to those meetings, attend those meetings and disseminate this. So yeah, that's going to take a while to do, but it's, it's worthy of the work. Great. Great. There's there are still a few more questions that, that have come in here. Sure. Um, if you had to pick one, which diagnosis guideline are you most excited about for the VWD community or your patients? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I personally think the diagnostic one is probably gonna have the biggest impact because particularly the 30 to 50%, I think that is probably the most earthquake, sort of earth shattering um, one that came out. It was the one that was hotly debated and it should be debated because we should have vigorous scientific discussions about these. I, I think the biggest one in, in the management one is that regardless of your type, 
um, you know, if you have recurrent bleeding episodes, prophylaxis should be considered. I really think that's going to move the field. Uh, I still feel like von Willebrand's is probably about 10 to 15 years behind hemophilia and prophylaxis, maybe even more, maybe 20 years. Uh, and I think this is going to be a good first step to push us uh, to catch up. But I think the uh, diagnostic one is really important, particularly the threshold of 30 to 50 percent, trying to discern that because we've gotten lots of questions about that. Um, we've made, you know, changes within our HTC um, to, uh, related to that. Great, thank you. Um, so if a family member has a 37% VWF level, but there are others in the family who have 8% and 10%, would you keep the diagnosis of VWV for the sibling with 37%? Sure, you know, it, it's important to remember that people often gonna have more than one variant that they've inherited. One, you know, both of them could be on chromosome 12 uh, as a sequence variant, or one of them could be uh, related to carbohydrates. Uh, one could be a clearance defect or some other issue um, related to clearance. And so there's no reason that all of those kids wouldn't be seen. And this guideline supports that, right? I mean, less than 50% with bleeding should be followed, should be considered as diagnostic. And if you're diagnostic, you should have access to the HTC. Um, and it's important uh, because that, that patient has, has at least one of the variants that the other siblings have. And we have a number of kids that have that with some that are very borderline and some that are obvious, um, you know, it's easy to make the diagnosis. So the more the merrier. Great. And um, related to a previous question, um, how do you think patients can best use this information on their path to a diagnosis? A little bit different. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the, we showed that last one and some of that was in jest, you know, it's like, this is all you got to do to make a diagnosis of Von Willebrand, just go through these, these easy 25 steps and you got your diagnosis. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, and this is just a start. One of the big, biggest challenges that we have right now is getting genetic testing done and approved um, by insurance. It's very challenging for us to do this. And um, we've actually been utilizing some of our financial support from Hemophilia Georgia to offset some of the costs of the genetic testing and trying to work with organizations to bring low cost um, you know, genetic testing. The cost is gonna go down for genetic testing. And I find, that it's, uh, I find that it's even more amusing. Oftentimes the genetic testing is cheaper than the diagnostic uh, functional assays, um, which sometimes can be in the thousand dollar range. So um, certainly it's not a cost issue, it's just some issue with the insurance companies, but it's been more challenging for that. Um, I think this guideline is gonna be helpful to make it a little bit more clear about where we draw the lines on diagnosis. Hopefully it'll help providers um, uh, help discern between the different subtypes. And you know, it, it's still gonna take surveillance studies um, through the Athen, through CDC, and hopefully some through NHF in the future to really be able to figure out um, and understand um, you know, the entire journey. We don't have a lot of data on pregnant women, postpartum women, perimenopausal women. There's lots of groups and part of that state of the science is that we're gonna identify those research priorities and lay them out and hopefully everybody will jump on them and, and attack all those different research priorities. Great, a um, couple more coming in if, if, you're, if you're okay with staying on. Sure, yeah, fine. Great. Um, what would be the greatest challenges in diagnosing VWD in developing countries and how can these be supported? Yeah, I mean, obviously when, when we come up with guidelines, you know, just like Alok Shravastava and the W of H group, when they come up with the, uh, the guidelines, they, they include developed and developing countries. Um, Cause you know, obviously the treatment is different regardless of what we want, we, how we feel about it. It is different resources do provide you better access and better level of care uh, to a point. And so we're hoping that, you know, some of this will be useful in, in, in you know, helping them craft a strategy to work up patients, like using bleeding scores, instead of sending diagnostic labs indiscriminately on patients, spending $1,000 on a patient that probably didn't need to have a bleeding workup, we could save that money and maybe it could be utilized, uh, you know, in the end, we're all, you know, using the same pool of money. And so I'm hoping that this will be useful in that community. I know that the organizations that are involved are gonna be working on disseminating this to them as well. 
I think particularly WFH and ISTH, I think they've been tasked to distribute that and try to adapt that to developing countries. So great, great question. Great. That's good to know, especially for our international audience that's on right now. Um, next question is, uh, what can we do as patients to help educate the community and our providers on the new mm -hmm. guidelines? Yeah, I mean, the best thing is to stay engaged. Um, you know, I, I think it's helpful to have this information. You know, most of us as a provider are willing to reach out to our colleagues anytime we have an issue. I think patients don't often realize that, you know, when we have a challenging patient, I'm usually asking three or four of my friends, like, what do you think, what would you do? And I mean, friends in the, in the bleeding disorder community, what to do. So I think it's important that we use this and I hope for this will we'll streamline the evaluation process and the diagnostic and management process uh, because it's been a little bit uh, vague. And I think that we've seen that in the community because the guidelines were a little bit vague before, the management was a little bit vague and it's not their fault. We just didn't have a lot of data. But since that last guideline, there's been an enormous amount of genetic data um, and molecular discoveries that have occurred you know, uh, in Europe and a lot of them done in the United States um, by you know, Bob Montgomery and Veronica Flood's group. And so uh, I think this is gonna help make it a little easier for us that aren't eating, breathing Von Willebrands every day so that's, that's really the goal. Great. Um, you know, we, we have a, a, a bit of a testimonial that came across and I'd like to sure. share this with you. Yeah. Um, I think it, it goes to the great work that, um, that you're doing and the group is really doing and have done on this. But um, this comes from um, someone anonymous who says, I was originally diagnosed with type one. With genetic testing, I learned that I have variants that have never been seen before and that I don't have type one and also have qualitative factor seven. I'm so appreciative of the new guidelines. It gives me hope that others will have better experience as well too. Yeah, and um, there's a whole other process for patients that have variants of unknown significance. That may be what they're referring to. And um, you know, we have a great case here in which Dr. Zamowski and Dr. Batsuli were able to take a variant of unknown significance for a factor 10 deficiency patient who clearly had factor 10 deficiency and then actually turn it into a pathogenic variant. So it requires patients reporting their bleeding symptoms and it's a longer process, but um, that's where, you know, uh, it's a discussion another day with the genetic counselors and the geneticists. Yeah, great. Well, we're right up against the hour here, sir. And, and we, I, I just like to, you know, take the time to, to say thank you. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for um, your time and your expertise. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Great. Um, please note that, um, that uh, this recorded webinar will be available on uh, Friday, May 7th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archived webinars. Um, also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for weekly Wednesday webinars. Um, Dr. Sidoni, thank you once again for joining us and for sharing the, the information. Um, thanks again to the audience for your activity and uh, everyone have a great day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.